And now, I'd like to introduce our presenters. Megan Dink is a field sales engineer at Roden Swartz, specializing in computer-aided design, power electronics, digital design, manufacturing, and content creation. Working on a proven ground to test superchargers has fueled her involvement in automotive EMC applications at Roden Swartz. Megan graduated from the Ohio State University with a Bachelor of Science in Mechanical Engineering. Our other presenter for today is Jeremy Klein, who is a product manager at Roden Swartz with over 10 years of both lab and field experience in test and measurement. Jeremy has authored numerous white papers, presentations, videos, and webinars on a wide variety of topics, including EMC, amplifiers, interference hunting, direction finding, and general radio frequency applications. Jeremy graduated from the University of Texas at Austin with a Bachelor of Science in Electrical Engineering and the University of Southern California with a Master of Science in Medical Device and Diagnostic Engineering. So, without further ado, let's turn our attention to Understanding Challenges in Device Validation Testing with Megan Dink and Jeremy Klein. Hi, Megan and Jeremy. It is all yours. Take it away. Okay, great. Thanks for the introduction and thank you to everyone for attending today. Let's get started. Starting with our agenda, I will kick us off with historical challenges, some test setups you all may be familiar with and what you can do about them. Then I'll go into current market trends, things we see more often today, and then I'll hand it off to Jeremy for modern testing challenges and future considerations. Then we'll have some time at the end for Q&A. Starting with the past, I will review some more well-known device validation challenges you all may be familiar with. From transparent amplifiers, when you have a signal generator but you need to increase the power, adding an amplifier and making sure it doesn't change the signal, pulsed applications, when you have a pulse, but you also need to use an amplifier to increase the power, keeping that envelope shape, passive intermodulation, putting two tones through your device, highly accelerated life testing, putting tons of forces on your device to see how it reacts, and load pull, changing the impedance at both the input and the output. From this point on, I will expand on each of these starting with transparent amplifiers. Transparent amplifiers are one of the more well-known challenges. In an ideal case, the device under test would be tested with the signal originally generated by the signal generator. But this is not always possible. Usually a higher power is necessary and an amplifier is added. It is important that this amplifier does not change the output of the signal, only increases its power. The added nonlinearity by the amplifier in between should be as low as possible in order not to falsify the device under test's performance. Let's look at an example of this. Here we have a signal generator. You can see the power level only gets up to about 0 dBm. On the other axis, we are comparing EVM, or error vector magnitude. Error vector magnitude is a great measurement for showing transparency. It includes many different factors from IQ imbalance to time skew and noise floor. The EVM performance of the signal generator stays around 3%. Now let's add an amplifier. Still at the same frequency of 3.5 gigahertz, you can see the amplitude gets all the way up to about 40 dBm. As for the EVM performance, the EVM stays under 2% all the way up to 35 dBm. The EVM stays at the same scale as before, but is able to increase the output level by 30 plus dBm. When a good amplifier is used, you do not need to worry about this challenge. It should only change the output power.
Now for pulsed signals. Pulsed signals are widely used for tests and applications, for example, like radar. The challenge of pulses is keeping the shape of the pulse through an amplifier. Considering classes of amplifiers, one might think that the best amplifier is the one with a 100% conduction angle or pure class A, but that's not always the case. It is shown that often there is an optimal conduction angle that produces the best reproduction of the original pulse and that this conduction angle is not necessarily 100%. This is where class AB amplifiers are typically used. You're able to find that sweet spot of a conduction angle for your pulsed application. Speaking of amplifier classes, amplifiers have a few different classes which determine its conduction angle, application, and type of output power. The conduction angle is the percentage of time during which the amplifier is conducting power or amplifying. For example, a conduction angle of 360 degrees means the amplifier is conducting over the entire input power cycle. A conduction angle of 180 degrees means the amplifier is only conducting half the time. Higher conduction angles mean higher linearity and better at imitating the input, but come at the cost of lower efficiency and higher temperatures. So now for the specific classes of amplifiers, there's class A, class B, and class AB. Class A amplifiers conducts over the entire input power cycle. There's a 360 degree conduction angle, and even though we're talking about device validation testing, this is mostly used for EMC. Class B amplifiers have a 180 degree conduction angle, meaning they conduct only over half the input power cycle. And class AB amplifier have that conduction angle that lies between 360 and 180 degrees. They're usually lighter weight, lower cost, with increased efficiency, but they are more susceptible to damage from high VISWAR levels. What is VISWAR? VISWAR is voltage standing wave ratio. It is the ratio of the peak voltage to minimum voltage along a transmission line. The best setups have a value as close to one as possible where all the forward power is being absorbed by the load. When there's a large amount of reflected power or visoir, an amplifier needs to have a way to protect itself from damage. This is done by foldback. The amplifier decreases its output power until the reflected power has decreased. Even though class AB amplifiers are more susceptible to damage from visoir, Foldback can help protect itself. Another historical challenge is passive intermodulation, or PIM. Passive intermodulation includes junctions of dissimilar metals, corrosion, rust, loose or overtightened connections, manufacturing or installation defects, and any passive component. PIM may occur in cables, connectors, antenna elements, and duplex filters. PIM products are usually undesired signals that can fall into other channels. So when it comes to base stations, PIM signals can coincide with the receiver path frequency of the duplex filter and degrade the sensitivity. Because of this, PIM testing of duplex filters is essential. Here is a PIM setup. PIM measurements require two tones to be applied to the DUT, ideally swept in frequency and power, then looked at for a third order product at the predicted frequency. You need a VNA and two amplifiers. Using a four port VNA with its two internal sources, you're able to generate two frequency tones that can be swept quickly with a single instrument. The two tones are then applied to an amplifier to generate high power levels. The challenge of this test is the need to provide stable signals at high output levels. Between thermals and settling times, it is hard to predict how much time is necessary to achieve stable operation. Time is crucial 
and it is undesirable to wait for steady state conditions. One solution to this challenge is automatic level control, or ALC. ALC independently controls the source output power. It is measured at the reference receivers of the associated ports. ALC makes it possible to overcome settling times and amplifier output power variations. The output of the amplifiers are in a closed loop with the VNA, so the ALC of the VNA is able to control the output power. PIM testing performance essentially depends on the settling time of the power amplifiers, which in turn impacts level accuracy, stability, and test time. ALC provides a unique solution for an extremely fast, highly accurate, and reproducible PIM measurement. Another example of ALC can be seen here. This setup is with a signal generator and power sensor. This setup is only capable of one tone, unlike our PIM setup, but is the same technology just shown in a different way. Automatic level control can help you in many different types of setups. Now for highly accelerated life testing, or HALT. This includes testing a product with increasing stress levels of temperature, vibration, RF power, and other forces to quickly uncover problems. The process includes applying a stress to see how it fails. It is not necessarily a pass-fail test, but an opportunity to improve design. You're able to determine the failure modes, root causes, and the limits of the product. Later in the presentation, Jeremy will share a specific setup, what the challenges are, and what you can do about them. This testing tests the corner cases of your devices. I like to think of user equipment in Florida during the summer. The manufacturer isn't going to wait for a sunny day to take its device down to Florida, but rather put it in a thermal chamber to test its limits. Now for load pool. Load pool is a method for characterizing RF components through impedance variation. It validates performance, ruggedness, and efficiency. Load pool relies on the flexible variation of the impedance acting on the amplifier. You're able to simulate all operating conditions, trying to find the best operating conditions for the future. It enables you to characterize your device as a function of varying load impedances. Looking at the setup a little closer, you have a VNA, an amplifier, and a source impedance tuner and a load impedance tuner. You're able to change both the impedance on the input and the impedance on the output to characterize your device. Now for current market trends. I will review the trends of today from 5G to over-the-air testing to automotive and medical wireless coexistence and record and playback. Starting with 5G, everything is growing in frequency. Higher bandwidth is driving complexity, and this includes systems, components, and everything in between. With higher frequencies comes the need for higher output powers. Digital pre-distortion will help get us there and decrease the ACLR and increase the power level. New millimeter wave FR2 creates new challenges never seen before. One of these challenges being maintaining high dynamic ranges from the lower frequencies. We want to make sure there's a similar performance for components up into that millimeter wave range as they have in FR1. When it comes to user equipment, a higher level of integration has eliminated traditional test ports. We will talk about this a little later, but testing needs to be done a different way. When it comes to base stations and infrastructure, 5G is driving more ports. Beamforming components need to support multiple antennas that require a multi-port network analyzer solution. 
Bandwidth continues to grow with research up to 80 gigahertz. This frequency will only be possible if we start with the components. Like I talked about with user equipment, with more integration between chips, components, and systems, we're losing traditional test ports, meaning we have to test a different way. This means over-the-air testing, where hard connections are not needed. The challenge of this is getting enough power to overcome the air losses to connect with the device. Plus, with high frequencies of 5G, it is even harder. This is the same setup seen in coexistence testing, but we are seeing it more and more every day as we are losing those traditional test ports. There are some industries leading the way with coexistence testing, such as the automotive industry. Similar to the trend of more components in complexity means over-the-air testing, the same works for a vehicle. There are multiple antennas, electronics, connections, computers, radios, protocols like Bluetooth, Wi-Fi, automotive ethernet. It is basically an extension of your phone. Automotive manufacturers need to test many antennas and systems all at once while all sitting in a specific position of the car. Here they connect a radio communication tester, vector signal generator, spectrum analyzer, all to an amplifier to create a field strong enough to point at the vehicle and connect. There is a link antenna connecting to the vehicle, an interference antenna adding interference, and a monitoring antenna monitoring how sensitive that link antenna is to interference. The manufacturer is trying to check for interference to degrade performance. Some of this performance is a matter of life and death and others are a convenience of music. With this setup, the manufacturer is able to check interference and the connected signals. Another industry leading the way is the medical device industry. This setup uses the same instruments from a spectrum analyzer radio communication tester, signal generator, and amplifier, all in an anechoic chamber. This test attempts to connect with the device while adding interference signals. This is in reference to the ANSI C6327 standard. When you are in a hospital, this monitor will help the nurses and doctors do their job. You wanna make sure nothing like your phone or radio or TV will interfere with the signal. And for the last trend, record and playback with an automotive battery management system. This is a wireless battery management system, so you can imagine there are quite a few issues when it comes to coexistence. After being out in the field, they reported some coexistence issues even after testing. The solution was to record that real world RF spectrum that they found in the field and be able to replay the test in the lab. When you replay these real-world signals, there are high frequencies out there like 5G. The playback system requires a large amount of memory and an amplifier capable of boosting the signal high enough to reach the system. Wrapping everything up so far, we are inching to where we are going today. More wireless testing with more wireless systems, higher frequencies, meaning even more power to reach these systems. Now I'll hand it over to Jeremy. All right, thank you, Megan. Let's move on to test challenges that we're commonly seeing today as a result of the current market trends that Megan just covered. In this section, we'll cover three major topics. We're going to talk about maximizing test throughput. And by test throughput, I'm not talking about data rates or bandwidth that you would commonly hear with 5G. I'm talking about the total number of devices under test that you can get through proper testing in a lab in a given day. We'll also talk about achieving field strength at higher frequencies. We know that the higher the frequency, the more attenuation you would have. With the proliferation of 5G applications and needs, we're going to run into this a lot. We know that field strengths are going to be more complicated to meet in today's testing world. Last but not least, 
We'll also talk about minimizing footprint in the lab, trying to reduce the amount of equipment that you need. Let's start with the first item on the list, maximizing test throughput. So when it comes to maximizing test throughput, the biggest question we need to ask ourselves is, how do you increase the number of devices that can be tested in your lab in a given day? Well, there's typically three very common challenges, cost considerations, space limitations, and or resource challenges. When it comes to existing test setups that we know today, balancing these three things can be quite difficult. In order to increase the number of devices going through your lab on a given day, you would need to find a way to perform faster measurements, which in turn suggests you might need a more skilled labor force. It's also very possible you need to add more people performing the tests in your lab. So how can we get around this? One way, which we'll talk about a little later, is to minimize your test equipment footprint in the lab. That's a way to future-proof your lab, if you will. But ultimately, we're trying to make smarter choices about what equipment is capable of testing. Let's take a look at a couple different solutions that can help with this problem. One proposed solution to these challenges is to use what are called dual band or twin band amplifiers. A good majority of amplifiers available today, whether they use modern solid state technology or not, are known as what are called single band amplifiers. As the name suggests, this means you can only test one frequency band with an amplifier at a time. It typically has one RF output. In today's testing world, you will likely hear many different frequency band names, including band A, B, C, and so on. There's a decoder on the slide here, if you will, showing you which frequency bands cover which frequencies. So what if you could put multiple frequency bands into one amplifier chassis? This is what's achieved with twin band and dual band amplifiers. With dual band amplifiers, you can have two, if not more, frequency bands built into one amplifier chassis. With twin band amplifiers, you can have two RF outputs for the same frequency band. This effectively doubles your testing throughput at that station. And as an added bonus, you didn't increase your equipment footprint at all. With some of these amplifiers, you can have simultaneous RF outputs. With other configurations, only one would be active at a time. But regardless of the approach, there are optional switches that can be integrated into the housing for additional testing flexibility. This solution is all about covering as many test requirements as possible into one test station. As we move forward with emerging 5G requirements, we know that we will move beyond 6 GHz into what will be known as F-band frequency space, where output power will need to be generated at millimeter wave frequencies. This will be a difficult feat, but this is where we're headed. Let's move on to the second challenge that we'll discuss in this section. In this case, we're going to talk about testing high-power MMICs, or monolithic microwave integrated circuits, for 5G base stations. We know from earlier that 5G is driving a lot of new developments, and with those developments come new challenges. Shown here is one example, which involves halt testing. This is something that Megan covered earlier, and in this case, the halt system is being used to test high-power MMICs. And as you can see on the slide, there are, of course, several challenges associated with this kind of testing. That includes, but is not limited to, meeting the input power tolerance, worrying about testing up to 16 devices at once, putting the device under test in a climate chamber, injecting power to it, testing the device's limits, heating up the devices in a climate chamber, and thus applying thermal stress, and making sure the device under test still performs under different temperatures, and, and many, many other considerations. But what I want to talk today about is the idea of achieving field shrinks at higher frequencies. This is, of course, something 5G is driving more and more as we go on through time. We know that there's higher attenuation at higher frequencies, but that presents a tough challenge for us. How do we squeeze more performance, more output power, out of an amplifier to ensure we can generate enough power to create a desired field shrink? One common solution to this exact question is to use something called an adjustable bias point. This is something that Megan covered in her part of the presentation and goes back to the discussion about what kind of conduction angle you're using. For these two ca cases, class A and class AB, we're talking about conduction angles that would be somewhere between 180 and 360 degrees. An adjustable bias point 
allows you to select between class A and class AB. There are two major modes on these so-called smart amplifiers that allow you to go back and forth. And these modes are called high visor mode and high output power mode, sometimes abbreviated high power mode. Let's start with high power mode. In this mode, the amplifier will have approximately 150% of the rated power of what we would call a more normal amplifier that we've known for years and years with an important assumption you have to ensure that your visoir is less than two to one. Recall that with visoir, ideally, you want to be as close to one as possible. In many practical cases, visoir can be up to three, four, five, six to one, and so on. The other mode, high visoir mode, assumes that you have a much higher visoir. And in this case, your trade-off is that you wouldn't have as much output power, or a, a high ceiling, if you will, but this amplifier will perform more normally like you would see with other amplifiers on the market. Let's take a little bit of a closer look here. Recall earlier that class A is better used when you want to squeeze as much forward power as possible out of your amplifier. As you can see in this screenshot, class A is not as good at creating a pulse. We can see this in this example screenshot because the leading edge is very rounded. If you happen to work with EMC or component characterization, you know that there are typically stringent linearity requirements. In many cases, there is a demand for as much forward power as possible. In Class A, it's a perfect fit for this type of situation. Class A has a higher ceiling, if you will, for output power. And again, like we covered on the last slide, this is assuming you have low visoir, and you know that you have low visoir. Other applications require performance to replicate pulses, such as slam testing, burn-in testing, and more, and class AB is better suited for this kind of testing. As you can see in this side-by-side -side comparison, class AB amplifiers are more capable of creating a proper pulse shape. In this scenario, there is not as much tolerance for visoir, however. One really great thing with adjustable bias points is the ability to change the class of operation between class A and class AB on the fly. This means you do not have to stop power output to change the class of the amplifier. You can simply change the amplifier class while the RF output is active. You don't have to turn the amplifier off to do this. Beyond that, you can also choose a middle ground somewhere between class A and class AB to achieve amplifier performance somewhere between the two classes. Let's take a look at what this looks like in the real world. In a moment, I'll play a short video for you. Let me explain what you're about to see. In this example, an amplifier's output is being measured by an EMI test receiver. At the beginning of the demonstration, the amplifier's bias point is set to purely class A. You might have already guessed this because we know from the last couple slides that class A is good for driving more forward power, but not so much for achieving pulse shape. Let me go ahead and start the video, which should run for about the next 30 seconds or so. As we move on with the demonstration, the bias point is going to be set closer and closer to class AB. Remember, we just learned that you can be somewhere in the middle. You don't have to be purely class A or class AB, and this is a big advantage. At this point, we are in that middle ground somewhere. Notice how the amplitude of the signal is decreasing, but the leading edge of the pulse is becoming more and more square. Now, at the end of this video, we are at purely class AB, which is better suited for pulse applications. And you can see that our overall amplitude has dropped quite a bit from where we started, but at the trade-off here, we're achieving a much better pole shape. It depends on what you really want to do. Having the ability to go back and forth between class A and class AB is very advantageous. So let's sum this up. When reviewing literature for class A and class AB amplifiers, you'll likely see discussion about forward power versus visoir. We learned earlier that better visoir translates to higher forward power. And that makes sense because there's not as much energy being reflected due to an impedance mismatch. If a device under test load visoir is known, the power setting of the amplifier can be set to a maximum power for known visoir, and everything is great. But from a practical perspective, not everything is always that great. If you don't know your visoir, which is very common, you can accept a trade-off using an adjustable bias point. So in this graphic, study the blue line versus the red line. 
the blue line represents a class AB amplifier, one that is well suited for pulsed applications. Notice that class AB amplifiers do not achieve as high of a ceiling, if you will, for forward power as a class A amplifier does, as represented by the red line. While that's not going to help us achieve higher field strengths, if there is a large mismatch, say up to 6 to 1 Viswar, as suggested in this graphic by this dashed black line, then the amplifier still drives more forward power as compared to a class A amplifier by quite a bit, as you can see. You may notice a third gray line on this graphic as well. This suggests that you could set an amplifier's bias point somewhere between class A and class AB to get a healthy balance between the benefits of both approaches. This is something we just saw on the practical demonstration on the last slide. This is in fact possible to do with what we call today's smart amplifiers. And as we start to see more requirements emerging from 5G applications, this will be a very handy tool to help achieve field strengths under different conditions. Let's look at one last modern test challenge. This one has to deal with minimizing test equipment footprint in the lab. And for this one, we're looking at an example of a PIM test system. As discussed earlier, this is of course dealing with creating two test tones and then looking for intermodulation products. As we had with the last example, we can study many challenges associated with this system on the right-hand side of the slide. Achieving power level and visual accuracy is one, and then there's some considerations related to calibration and software control, and more. And one thing we discussed today already is that it's a challenge to keep stable output signals. One approach that helps is to use something called automatic level control, or ALC. As a quick aside, for this kind of PIM test system, that's a very common approach. But for today's discussion, I want to focus on what you see on the left side of this slide. This is a typical system used for PIM to cover three different frequency bands and generating two tones. Let's look a little closer to see if there's any way to improve this solution. Check out these two side-by-side -side test systems on the right-hand side of the slide. What if I told you that you could reduce the total footprint of the system by over half? In our current example for PIM, the left system is 42 height units tall. The test system on the right is only 20 height units tall. Which one would you rather have for the same exact test requirements? Both of these systems have some non-amplifier components, such as an EMI test receiver and signal generator, but when we focus on the amplifiers, there are of course clearly some big differences. Going back to at least a year or two ago, this particular PIM test system could be realized with one amplifier dedicated to each frequency band. This was using single band amplifiers, as we discussed earlier. In this case, bands B, C, D, and E were involved. And because the application is passive intermodulation, we needed to create two test tones. So that means this the test system needed a total of six amplifiers, three for each frequency band of one tone, and then three additional amplifiers for each frequency band of the other tone. Nowadays, we can combine frequency bands into what we call modular amplifiers. So you put two or three frequency bands into one chassis. If you want to cover those multiple frequency bands in one chassis, that's possible given today's amplifier technology. And as you look to minimize your equipment's footprint in the lab, this could be a very easy way to make room for more testing in the same lab space. All right, now that we've finished looking at modern test challenges, let's consider several things to think about in the future. For those of you designing everything from filters and switches to high power loads and transistors and more, you're facing a great number of challenges every day. We covered a lot of those challenges today, including PIM, SLAM testing, and many more. And while the overall goal is to test quickly and accurately as possible, we know it would help to minimize the test equipment footprint in your lab, and thus maximize the number of devices that can be tested in your lab in a given day. With all that in mind, as you've seen over the course of this webinar, 5G is driving new challenges. Amplifiers must support higher bandwidths today, and also higher frequencies. And as a result, they must be able to create higher output powers. As an industry, we're trending towards performing measurements over the air. 
The medical and automotive industries are leading the way with popular applications such as wireless coexistence and IQ record and replay. We learned about amplifier features that can help meet the challenges we're seeing today. Things like adjustable bias points and modular amplifiers help push the envelope, so to say, when it comes to squeezing as much output power as possible from an amplifier. We also learned that class AB amplifiers are best suited for pulsed applications. As modern test setups continue to become more and more complex, amplifiers will continue to play a crucial role in becoming as transparent as possible. But as we look forward from today, what will the rest of the 5G wave bring? We already know that component manufacturers are ramping up solutions that will be able to play into the FR2 frequency space. That means everything else must follow, and that includes test equipment. We discussed the challenges and potential solutions to achieving field strengths at these higher frequencies. One of those proposed solutions was the adjustable bias point. So-called smart amplifiers already have this feature today, but it's expected that this feature will become more and more critical to pushing for more forward power, especially as testing challenges continue to grow past 6 GHz and beyond into what we might call F-band. Last but not least, as we move on from today's presentation, let's ask the really interesting question. What might 6G bring along? It's never too early to start anticipating those challenges. All right, that will do it for today's presentation. Both Megan and I thank you again for attending today, and we'd also like to take one more opportunity to thank Washington Labs for hosting us. If you'd like to learn more about any of the topics presented today, there are several resources available at our website, www.rota-schwartz.com. Please feel free to check it out. At this point, let's go ahead and see if there's any questions we might be able to answer. Thank you, Megan and Jeremy, for such a wonderful, informative webinar. So for Megan and Jeremy, we do have a couple of questions, if you don't mind answering. Sure, go ahead. Let's do it. All right. Thank you. Um, the question I see is, why are Class B amplifiers generally not suitable for EMC? I can take that one. Class B amplifiers create a large amount of distortion and that is unsuitable for EMC and DVT. Um, usually we universally either use class A or class B amplifiers because they strike a good balance between linearity, heat dissipation, and output power. Um, but there are other classes of amplifiers too, such as class C, class D, that we didn't touch on today, but these are not used in EMC um, either. Okay, thank you, Megan, for that one. Um, I do have another question. For PIM, P-I-M measurements, is it required to have a four port VNA? I can take this one as well. That's a good question. Thanks, um, I think on my slide, I put a four port VNA, but you don't necessarily need to use that. You just need to make sure that there's two internal sources because you'll need to create those two frequency tones, um, two frequency tones at different frequencies for that pin testing. So with a four port VNA, you would have two internal sources, but you can find that in a two port or something else that works. All right, um, another question actually, which frequency band is most popular in the industry right now? Oh, that's a good one. That is a good one. I'll take that one. Um, I would say, historically speaking, band BC, and that's kind of an internal thing that, you know, I had the decoder in the middle of the presentation. By band BC, I'm talking about 80 megahertz to 1 gigahertz. That band has been very popular. Um, as things have gone on and we start to see the emergence of 5G especially, all the frequency needs are, are going higher and higher. So we're starting to see a lot more need for band D and E, and those are up in the 690 megahertz to 6 gigahertz range. Um, you know, especially as we push beyond 5G into, into 6G, like we were talking about at the very end, uh, certainly there's gonna be some frequency requirements going above 6 gigahertz into the millimeter wave band. So we'll start talking about things like band F here in the coming year or two. So yeah, it is a good question. It, it's kind of all over the place, but in general, going to <laughs> frequency. All right, thank you for that, Jeremy. Um, I do have another question. 
how okay. do you, how do you apply feedback and or ALC for the short period of a pulse signal? Um, I can take that one. So uh, we won't go back to the slide or anything like that, but we, we had a diagram of ALC where basically the output of a power sensor is connected to kind of the brains of the operation. It could be a VNA, it could be a signal generator, but we're automatically detecting what power is coming out of an amplifier through a power sensor as an example. So if you're saying I want 20 dBm, but the power sensor only reads 18 dBm, there's a feedback loop from the power sensor back to the, let's say a signal generator that's creating that signal in the, in the beginning. And it's gonna tell the sig gen automatically, boost your power up a little bit because there's some attenuation in that path. And so that, that's kind of how the feedback is, a, is achieved. It's considered a closed loop feedback system. All right. Well, thank you for responding to that. Um, at this moment, I don't see any additional questions, which to me means from past, um, you did a very good job, a very well job um, explaining everything during your presentation. Um, so at this time, again, I'm going to double check one more time. Again, I don't see yet any additional questions. So once again, I'd like to go ahead and thank Megan and Jeremy for taking time out to enlighten us about understanding challenges in device validation testing. Please stay tuned for our next upcoming webinar sometime next month. We are in the process with confirming dates and times with the presenters, so please make sure you visit our website to subscribe to our Washington Labs Academy to receive updates. This is easily done by visiting WLL.com. You'll click on the training tab in the upper right corner, and you'll want to go ahead and fill in your information where you see sign up for updates. On behalf of the Washington Labs Academy and Ronan Swartz, we would like to thank you for you all for attending. I would now go ahead and end this event and please enjoy the rest of your day, but most importantly, please be safe. Thank you everyone. Have a great day.